Hello. Um, today is Saturday, November 4th. My name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. Today is day 29 um, since the beginning of the war between Israel and Hamas. Um, I want to apologize. I know I've been doing these daily videos and they've been getting long. I've been getting into the weeds. I've been doing lots of details. My goal is to keep these at 10 minutes or less. And today I just wanted to provide a little bit of commentary from voices other than my own. Um, the first one uh, is from an Israeli peace activist um, who's giving just a summary of what things look like from her perspective on the ground in Israel. Uh, and these are the things she says. She says, hundreds of civilians die every day in bombings. Tens of thousands more lose their homes. That's number one. Number two, children, women, men, and elderly abducted in Gaza. Their fate is unknown, and no one in the government is talking about how to get them back. Number three, settlers and the army just do what they want at the coast. Over 70 people have been killed, at least 10 of them by settlers. In Area C, that's in the West Bank, the occupied territories, community after communities are leaving uh, daily threats and attacks. The army closes villages without access to water and food. Maybe it's settlers, but the settlers wear uniforms and altogether they're preventing Palestinians from doing everything. Number four, there are funerals all over the country. Number five, dozens, if not hundreds of Palestinian students and teachers are citizens of Israel, and they've been suspended or fired for posts on Facebook on things that are thousands of different lights away from supporting terrorism. There are real cases of support for incitement also, but the vast majority are not. Number six, police officials say it's forbidden to show solidarity with or support for Gaza, period. It's forbidden in Israel to demonstrate against the attack on Gaza, period. And it's applied by beating and arresting. Number seven, Palestinians inside Israel are modeled and viewed as the enemy, period, by the police and the media, uh, on Facebook, um, and uh, that's part of the reality. Number eight, there's at least half a million uh, internally displaced people in the Gaza Strip. The supply of water and electricity is running out and people will die of thirst. She said it's scary to protest right now. For real, this is scary. Threats on the network, right-wingers sharing people's addresses, threats of dismissal, Chief Shomer, that will put us on buses to Gaza. I have been hearing this from human rights groups, and I was like, what? So Israel is threatening that if Israelis, Israeli Jews, advocate on behalf of a ceasefire or on behalf of Palestinians' rights in Gaza, they're being threatened that they will be put on a bus and sent to Gaza if they identify with Gaza. To say that I feel pain for every girl and boy that dies there, I'm in pain, put me on the bus. But it is not time for that either. It feels like no one would listen if we protest and yell and scream. With the hate that is going all around, who will listen? But it scares me no less than everything that is happening right now. From this list, I could add a million more things to it. It's today, after, after what? Will you be here between the sea and the Jordan? Will there be any company, any friendship, anything worth fighting for? Can there be any hope here? And when it's the thing that I'm the most afraid of, that there is no choice but to keep on fighting, each in their own way, each according to their abilities, but to continue, to continue to say that I will never shut up when murder is being done, not on October 7th and not on October 19th. It's scary to say today that the killing in Gaza must be stopped. It's even scarier to live in a place where children are dying and we are silent. So again, that is the voice of an Israeli um, human rights activist. Um, I have been so moved and encouraged by so many, uh, or at least a, a faithful remnant or a small number <laughs> of people in Israel, Jews in Israel, who are actually activists who are accompanying, you know, Palestinians in the South Hebron Hills, um, Pal Israelis who are walking alongside Palestinians and risking a uh, death as well. And so that is a snapshot of um, what life is like in Israel right now. But I didn't want to end with that. I wanted to end with the voice um, of a commentary. This is from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. This is an article written by Amr um, Hamzawi, who said, pay attention to the Arab 
the Arab world's public response to the Israel Hamas war. And I thought this was deeply encouraging. And the subtitle of this piece is The Peaceful Nature of the Mass Mobilization reflects a growing trend to renounce violence. And so might this encourage our um, spirits for today? I won't read it in its entirety, but I'll just summarize and read some of the parts. Once again, he writes, the Arab street is the epicenter of peaceful demands for change. Protests have swept across the region, Casablanca, Algiers, Tunis, Cairo, Amman, Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, Manama, in support of Palestinians in Gaza and their basic human rights in the face of an ongoing Israeli military assault, horrifying living conditions. The peaceful nature of this wave of Arab mass mobilization reflects a growing trend to renounce violence as a means of pursuing political objectives and the desire for stability following the turbulent years after the 2011 Arab Spring. What I love about this is so much in the U.S. context, we don't hear this. We don't, we hear about the incidents of violence. We don't hear about the mass protests that are nonviolent. And I remember this because I lived in Jerusalem and so many, even during the Arab Spring, at least at parts, there were beautiful things that were happening that were not reported on in the United States. So Amr um, Hamzawi continues and he talks about the public response after October uh, 7th and how um, in Arab governments, civil society, media outlets, uh, some influential social media accounts were quick to condemn the violence and to call for the protection of life on both sides. When governmental and non-governmental voices ignored the targeting of Israeli civilians, their one-sided opinions were quickly marginalized. And on October 26th, as Israeli bombardment of Gaza intensified, nine Arab foreign ministers issued a statement reaffirming their opposition to violence and the killing of civilians. He continues, together the mainstream Arab public space put forward a pro-peace and pro-life values without any attempt to justify Hamas's actions, neither with references to the ongoing occupation or the siege of the Palestinian territories, nor by evoking militant Islamist anti-Jewish rhetoric that has lost its popular appear appeal in recent years. Throughout this article, he has citations, and we will put a link to this um, in the chat. Um, he says, rather, many Arab commentators and influencers place the occupation and siege as key facts in the persistent denial of Palestinian rights to self-determination. And they highlighted daily struggles of Palestinians in the West Bank due to the aggressive expansion of Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem because of forced displacement and Gaza as a result of the inhumane siege. He talks about dehumanization of Palestinians in media and in policy circles. But then he says, this initial nonviolent and humanist response has held its ground with the emergence of a pro-Palestine mass mobilization in several Arab countries. Um, the Arab street has watched as the civilian population in Gaza falls victim to Israeli attacks and is left without international protection or aid amid a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, and he goes on to tell us uh, some of the things that have happened. Um, and he also talks about how this should condemn Western double standards and complicity, which if you have not read Churches for Middle East pieces, uh, yesterday we put out a statement. We have put out numerous, you know, over the course uh, since October 7th. And yesterday's statement was just about the complicity of the U.S. government and how we are not doing enough. And we're saying one thing from our mouth and doing another thing in our actions and how we have to be consistent. If we care about humanitarian assistance, then, you know, make our aid to Israel conditional on it. And we should be calling for a ceasefire, not only cease, uh, you know, humanitarian pauses, for example. I just want to read um, the last uh, paragraphs um, of this. He says, the trend towards renouncing violence in the mainstream Arab public space um, and the street has been on the rise. In recent years, an overwhelming majority of respondents, including those from several Arab countries, have stated their rejection of the use of force or violence 
uh, for political causes. Uh, the Arab barometer surveys have documented that the sheer majority of Arabs, over 90%, disapprove of extremist organizations and condemn their acts of terror. Americans, please, please, please read these statistics, read this analysis. This is a think tank, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. 90%, more than 90%, according to the Arab surveys, disapprove of extremist organizations and condemn um, acts of terror. Although Hamas and Palestinian groups have been predominantly seen in the Arab world as resistance movement, their violence against Israeli civilians has been largely condemned. A clear preference for peace between Israelis and Palestinians on the basis of a two-state solution has been on the rise. Now, this support for nonviolence can be fragile, especially if protesters' demands are not met. I've witnessed these changes firsthand as the peaceful movements in 2011 in Egypt, which was what I was talking about, as nine nonviolent demonstrators took to the streets in Tunisia and other Arab countries to call for rights and freedoms and to demand an orderly trans position to democracy, but then demonstrators' hopes and aspirations withered away and degenerated to violence and militant activism. He says, now I fear we might be taking or observing a similar development. But in the current trend to renounce violence in the Arab street, the collective rejection of dehumanizing narratives in the mainstream public space, I see a launch pad for the possible revival of the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians with wide Arab backing for the first time. Will Israel play along? Will Arab majorities stick to nonviolence to put an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I truly hope, and I pray that this time our region can avoid the fate of failed transitions and lost peace. So I found that analysis by the Carnegie Center deeply, deeply encouraging. But friends, we have to create space for peace. We have to encourage our country to get out of the way and to encourage Israel to pursue peace, you know, to yes, address, you know, address the realities of Hamas. Yes, demand that hostages be returned home, but stop bombing innocent civilians in Gaza. Immediate, immediate and adequate access to humanitarian assistance, condemning all violence, pursuing nonviolent uh, resistance and resolution to conflict. So, Peace be with you. Uh, tomorrow, I will focus on the realities of the church uh, and Christians in the middle of this um, war. Um, and that's what we'll focus on then. Uh, God be with you.